Uh, my name is Sharmila, I'm a software engineer at Airbnb, and uh, Janusz spoke to you about our JVM monorepo, and I'll be giving you the web monorepo edition of this talk. Um, so we're effectively done with our migration. However, uh, one of our tenants was that we would not move forward with Bazel unless we were either maintaining or improving performance. To that end, we introduced Bazel in CI, where we knew we would receive the largest benefit. If you take a look at uh, unit testing in particular, we saw 42% faster incremental runs, and this is because we greatly benefited from Bazel's test result caching. So in this talk, you'll know how big is our code base, how we achieved cross-platform caching, and the steps that we took to optimize the size of our Bazel sandboxes to improve performance. Our web monorepo is the home to Airbnb.com, as well as various applications and tools and libraries. Uh, we maintain over 10 million lines of TypeScript and JavaScript code, over 150,000 files, over 10,000 build files, and there's hundreds of people who are regularly contributing code. And one thing I'll call out here is that the files to build files are not evenly distributed. So our packages can be really large or really small. It's kind of all over the place. Our engineers run their builds on macOS, and everything runs in CI and Linux. Uh, we could also be using different architectures, so cross-platform caching is important to us. And in pursuit of this mission, we did a few things to effectively leverage Bazel's cache in our local environments as well as CI. So I'll be speaking about external dependencies first, and this is namely NPM dependencies in our case. We made quote unquote universal binaries, and uh, you should have seen a slide in Janusz's presentation too that went over this. And uh, we handle non determinism continuously um, using very similar strategies. Uh, so, first off, even though every engineer at Airbnb is using Yarn as their package manager, we found that the files on disk can actually differ. And we use a couple of flags to ensure that this is stable. So the first one is check files. And what this does is validate the package integrity. And it'll make sure that the files on disk actually match what uh, is expected for that package. And this comes out of the box in Yarn 2. We're using an older version. Frozen lock file will ensure that you don't have any implicit dependency version bumps. So if you've got like a looser semver syntax, maybe it allows pa like patch versions, for example. Um, frozen lock file will make sure that you only install the versions that are de de or defined in your lock file, which we check into the repo. If you've ever installed dependencies in a JavaScript application and had it fail because you're using the wrong version of Python um, and you're wondering, like, what's happening? Um, the culprit is Node-JIP. So this is a tool that will help you build C and C++ binaries in Node.js applications and make them available to Node.js. So these are not uh, platform independent. Uh, so to make our dependencies portable, we actually push the build of these uh, to runtime instead. We don't include them in our targets. And then to handle the latency from that build, we cache things on multiple layers. So we cache in our Docker images that run CI, in our remote workers as well. We do remote builds at Airbnb. So this is what I mean by universal binaries. We have a binary here for Node.js, and it's bringing along uh, all kinds of dependencies for Darwin and Linux, for AMD and ARM, and it runs this bin node script. So uh, when that script runs, it will pick the right binary uh, depending on the environment that you're in. And for non-determinism, this is actually documented in the Bazel docs as well. And it looks like there's some changes coming to this, which is exciting. Uh, we diff execution logs. And here, uh, we're using the JSON file because uh, we like working with JSON. And the output looks something like this. You'll see a bunch of command args, um, inputs, outputs, their hash, and the size of each um, input. 
And then uh, we have a script that we rolled internally. It's just called exactdiff, and it'll give you some nice output that looks like this. And I just want to say that this is not just for like a platform difference. We run this continually in CI uh, by running uh, two uncached builds to catch any non-determinism that creeps up. So even though we're achieving cache hits, we still found that our sandboxes were too big, our targets were really large, uh, and we weren't, we were taking too long to build, essentially. Our performance wasn't exactly where we would like it to be. So we'll talk through a few strategies to optimize the size of our inputs. And these are going to be a little JavaScript specific. So we use ESLint as, as our linter, and one of the things we did was do an audit of all our lint rules and prune any of the heavy ones. We use a, f a flag called list files in TypeScript. And uh, we also generate our build files. And I'll give you the web edition of build file generation here. So ESLint is highly configurable. It has a plugin architecture system that allows you to do a lot of different things. So it can operate on a single file. It can also operate on multiple files in the repo or on dependencies. So we decided that an ESLint rule in our repository is not allowed to require any additional files or dependencies to run. And when we did this audit, we found that there weren't many of these. Uh, there were very few. A lot of them we had contributed. And uh, many of them were made redundant when you're using TypeScript. This is an example of an open source one. The open source ones usually come from ESLint plugin import. And import extensions is kind of silly to me because we were using this for the sole purpose of not allowing JavaScript and TypeScript file extensions in our import statements. And this one would actually check whether the file existed on disk first before making that validation. So we replaced it with a static check, and it was much faster. And so in the end, our lint target just contains your linter, the configuration files that you need, and any JavaScript or TypeScript files in scope. Um, so I don't know if you're realizing now that we don't have to lint any downstream dependencies anymore. Um, we only lint direct depths. And this resulted in a pretty like huge drop off when it comes to runtime. Uh, we saw that our rule got roughly 70% faster. So it went from about 8 to 10 minutes to about 1 to 2 and a half minutes on average. So list files is a flag in TypeScript that is used for uh, compilation. It will tell you exactly what files you need to type check a particular project. And we use this to just heavily trim down the size of our type inputs. And um, we also tar up our types. And this was important for uh, remote execution uh, because we weren't sending lots and lots of loose files up the wire. We were actually spending a lot of time um, you know, uh, building input trees. And the tar helped to reduce that time a lot. And then the resulting target only has whatever is necessary for type checking. So if some project depends on is equal, it's not going to bring in all of the files for that particular package. It'll only bring in whatever is necessary for type checking. And we saw that this made things roughly about 60% faster. Uh, we went from about a 30-minute runtime to about 10 to 12 minutes. So lastly, I want to say that this is uh, the same script that's in our JVM monorepo. This is just uh, the TypeScript version. And I have this library here called Lottie. It's an open source animation library from Airbnb. Um, I add an import. I run the script. It adds my dependency to a target and a build file. And this is. Uh, the version of this particular script that I really wanted to show here. So, so Lottie has an implicit dependency on a package called Canvas. And Canvas is available in the browser. Um, however, it's not available in Node.js, where uh, our unit tests run. So to express this implicit dependency, I can actually add a comment in my TypeScript file that says, Bazel keep Canvas, and we'll treat this like an import. Sorry. 
Um, and when we run sync configs, it will generate this into our build file. And you, if you've used Gazelle, you might have seen keep comments in the build file. This is the same exact concept, except now our dependencies remain in our module code. So if this particular file is moved or deleted, my build file like is also updated without the developer having to do any work. This is also really comes in handy if you're dealing with any string configs. So ESLint configs, Babel configs, like things that express uh, dependencies as strings, you can annotate them using the same method. So in conclusion, uh, Bazel has offered us more than performance. So between the JVM and the, mono the web monorepo, our builds now speak the same language, and we're no longer islands of isolated knowledge. We can share a lot of the same tools and ideas. Also, engineers can hop between them and know how to operate, which is a win for developer productivity at Airbnb overall. If you want more content from me, um, I did a Bazel Community Day talk in 2023. I didn't want to put a uh, QR code sending you to a YouTube video of myself. And, uh, uh, but this is in Shed, so the slides are uploaded there. Uh, we also have a Bazel migration blog post coming out. It should be in the next week or so. Uh, these are the folks who work on web Bazel at Airbnb, Brian and Madison, who I wish were here today, and myself. Um, thank you. And if you want to reach me, um, you can email shermila at airbnb.com.